Great. Thanks, Erica. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, thanks so much for joining this evening. Uh, my name is Uma Deshmukh. I am a maternal fetal medicine specialist uh, here at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center. Um, I will be talking this evening about uh, prevention, evaluation, and management of obstetric hemorrhage. Um, I believe this will largely be review for many of you joining us this evening, um, but I'll also go over some clinical updates. These are the learning objectives for my talk. Um, we'll review definitions, epidemiology, and common etiologies of obstetric hemorrhage. We'll discuss some tools for risk stratification and preparation for those at increased risk. We'll consider evidence-based strategies for the prevention of obstetric hemorrhage, and we'll go over contemporary approaches for evaluation and management of obstetric hemorrhage with specific attention to our approach here at PIDNC. I have no disclosures. So I will start with a case, um, and uh, you can imagine that you're on labor and delivery caring for an otherwise healthy 40-year-old Gravita 1 Para 0 at 41 weeks gestation who was admitted for a late-term induction of labor. She has a prolonged induction with five doses of mesoprostol for cervical ripening and over 24 hours of Pitocin. She has a three-hour second stage and ultimately has a vaginal delivery with spontaneous placental expulsion and a second-degree laceration, which is repaired. Ten minutes after her delivery, she develops brisk vaginal bleeding, and within minutes, the EBL is estimated to be over one liter, and she's diagnosed with a postpartum hemorrhage. So this is a fairly classic scenario that many of us have experienced, um, and I'll just ask you to keep this patient in the back of your mind as we kind of go through the, uh, the talk, and we'll come back to this case later. So ACOG defines obstetric hemorrhage as a cumulative blood loss uh, of greater than or equal to 1,000 milliliters or blood loss accompanied by signs or symptoms of hypovolemia after delivery. Um, primary postpartum hemorrhage occurs within 24 hours of delivery, while secondary hemorrhage can occur anywhere uh, from 24 to hours to 12 weeks postpartum. Keep in mind that obstetric hemorrhage actually refers to any kind of excessive bleeding in a parturient. Um, and so this can be during pregnancy, during childbirth, or in the postpartum period. Um, I don't need to tell all of you that obstetric hemorrhage is a major cause of maternal morbidity and mortality. Worldwide, 800 women die from pregnancy-related causes every day, um, which uh, amounts to about one death every two minutes. And globally, 25% of these maternal deaths are due to obstetric hemorrhage. This goes up to 60% um, if you look just at the developing world. Obstetric hemorrhage is also a leading cause of maternal mortality here in the US, uh, responsible for 14% of pregnancy-related deaths, 70% of which are thought to be preventable. And data from the CDC tells us that postpartum hemorrhage resulting in transfusion is the leading cause of severe maternal morbidity in the US and rates of postpartum hemorrhage are rising. So what is the pathophysiology behind obstetric hemorrhage? Uh, we know that after delivery, normal post-placental hemostasis occurs by myometrial contraction, um, as well as the release of local decidual hemostatic factors and systemic clotting factors that help to prevent ongoing bleeding. So a disturbance in one or both of these mechanisms leads to most cases of hemorrhage, um, and the remaining cases are usually due to loss of intact vasculature, um, as in uh, the case of a trauma or lacerations that occur during delivery. Bleeding after delivery can be massive and rapid, and this is because, as we all know, in late pregnancy, uterine artery blood flow is 500 to 700 milliliters per minute and accounts for uh, about 15% of a patient's cardiac output. So about so two minutes of uncontrolled postpartum hemorrhage can easily result in a liter of blood loss. And this is why every minute counts when we're managing postpartum hemorrhage and why we must move quickly to stabilize the patient um, and identify the source of bleeding so we can treat it appropriately. The most common causes of obstetric hemorrhage can be sort of roughly divided into those that cause primary versus secondary hemorrhage. 
And we often think of the four T's mnemonic um, that includes tone, trauma, tissue, and thrombin. Um, abnormal uterine tone is the most common cause of postpartum hemorrhage, accounts for about 70 to 80% of obstetric hemorrhages. Trauma includes lacerations like cervical, vaginal, perineal, or vulvar lacerations, but also uh, includes things like uterine rupture or um, bleeding from the hysterotomy at the time of cesarean delivery um, or lateral extensions from the hysterotomy into the uterine arteries. Tissue uh, generally refers to retained placenta or abnormally adherent placenta, and thrombin refers to coagulopathy or platelet dysfunction, uh, which can be acute or acquired as seen in patients with DIC, uh, such as after an amniotic fluid embolism or a massive placental abruption, as well as in patients with preeclampsia or HELP syndrome. On the other hand, a patients with inherited coagulopathies um, can also present with either prim primary or secondary um, hemorrhage. Um, and, you know, an example would be a patient with von Willebrand's disease, um, where these patients tend to present with delayed hemorrhage. And then other causes of secondary hemorrhage that um, you'd want to keep in mind are placental site, uh, sub, placental site sub-involution, retained products of conception, and uterine infection. So ultimately, the diagnosis will really determine uh, the appropriate intervention. Uh, a number of well-established risk factors are associated with postpartum hemorrhage, as shown here in this table. Um, and I won't go over this table in detail. Um, I think the important thing really to take away is that patients without any risk factors can also experience postpartum hemorrhage. Um, so the bottom line is really that every uh, pregnant patient is considered to be at risk. And so for this reason, uh, here at BIDMC, we assign H status or uh, hemorrhage risk status to every patient admitted to labor and delivery. Um, those with no identifiable risk factors are considered H1 and only require a type and screen on admission, whereas those with uh, these risk factors listed here are considered above average risk and assigned H2 status. Um, so in addition to a type and screen, they are evaluated for eligibility for electronic cross match um, and uh, sort of increased awareness um, is um, important for patients in this category. Um, and if they are not eligible for electronic cross match, they're sort of elevated to H3 status. Mm -hmm. And then these are the risk factors associated with the highest risk for hemorrhage. They're assigned H3 status. These patients uh, must have an active type and cross match. Um, we require a second IV line placed for these patients, as well as having uh, ensuring uterotonics at delivery with sort of extra preparation and communication among providers in anticipation of possible hemorrhage. So detailed information about our OB hemorrhage risk tool and protocol can be found online um, among the our obstetric PPGDs and is posted on our labor and delivery unit. Um, so in terms of prevention, active management of the third stage of labor has been recommended as a method to, to reduce the incident of postpartum the incidence of postpartum hemorrhage. Um, the three components of active management include uh, postpartum oxytocin administration, uterine massage, and uh, controlled umbilical cord traction. Um, post prophylactic oxytocin, about at least 10 units, uh, really remains the most effective medication um, for reducing hemorrhage risk um, with the fewest associated uh, adverse effects. Um, and that the data are somewhat mixed on whether or not we should uh, combine oxytocin with a second uterotonic agent like methogen or mesoprostol. Um, some data suggest that um, having uh, two methods may actually improve um, outcomes and reduce risk. Um, so some providers do do this, and there is re relatively new data that suggests that adding tranexamic acid as a prophylactic agent for patients um, who are at high risk um, for hemorrhage uh, may be uh, beneficial as well. Um, uterine massage, um, there's actually limited data on this. There's uh, some uh, uh, data that suggests that uh, vigorous uterine massage has been associated with a reduced postpartum blood loss and the reduced need for additional uterotonics. 
Um, but generally, this is considered a low risk um, intervention. Um, and apart from patient discomfort, um, you know, is generally considered low risk enough to uh, recommend routine um, practice after delivery. Um, these are results from a meta-analysis of randomized trials comparing active versus expectant management of the third stage. Um, and they, uh, these authors found that uh, active management was associated with reduced risk for postpartum hemorrhage, um, for uh, postpartum maternal hemoglobin levels below nine, uh, for uh, maternal blood transfusion, as well as for the use of uh, secondary sort of therapeutic uterotonics. And the benefits of active management were most pronounced for patients um, who were considered to be high risk for postpartum hemorrhage. Um, so after delivery with those suspected, um, with suspected hemorrhage, initial assessment includes evaluation of symptoms and vital signs um, and examination and evaluation of uterine tone, quantification of blood loss, which I'm gonna talk more about, and laboratory evaluation. Um, so just important to remember that while bleeding from obstetric hemorrhage can certainly be dramatic in some cases, as in the case that I described, um, the diagnosis can be delayed in patients with concealed bleeding, um, in particular those with intra-abdominal bleeding or accumulation of blood within a uterus where the patient um, has a closed cervix. And so close attention to symptoms and vital signs is critical. And as we all know, pregnant patients are often relatively healthy with excellent reserve at baseline, so they can often tolerate large volume blood loss with good cardiovascular compensation um, and uh, relatively stable hemodynamics. And so this table just shows us that the changes in vital signs and symptoms um, that accompany different amounts of blood loss associated with obstetric hemorrhage. Um, and I really just included this to remind us that tachycardia and hypotension are actually uh, late signs of hemorrhage in a postpartum patient. And by the time a patient has these vitals, she may have already lost over a liter of blood. And so prompt attention to abnormal vital signs is really key. And findings from several maternal mortality review committees have shown that a delayed response to abnormal vital signs is a common factor in preventable mortality. Um, limited evidence suggests that maternal early warning systems that target specific vital sign criteria or critical situations and mandate an immediate response may actually uh, help to reduce maternal mortality and morbidity. So here at the IDMC, we have a MUSE protocol that I've um, kind of shown here. Um, this uh, alerts the OB team, the resource RN, and the anesthesiology team when these criteria are met um, with the expectation that a physician reports to the bedside within 10 minutes um, for a rapid response while the bedside nurse uh, sort of starts securing IV access obtaining labs and administering supplemental oxygen if needed. And uh, when assessing patient vitals, it can actually be helpful to consider the shock index, um, which is a very easy to calculate ratio of the patient's heart rate to systolic blood pressure. Um, this has actually been shown to be a useful indicator of hemodynamic instability and hypovolemia among trauma and sepsis patients. Um, and several studies have suggested that this could be a useful predictor of postpartum hemorrhage and hemodynamic compromise. Um, so a shock index of less than 0 0.9 to 1.1 is considered normal for pregnant patients, and really anything above this threshold um, deserves close attention. Um, and in addition to assessing symptoms and vital signs, um, accurate estimation of blood loss is critical for planning appropriate interventions. Um, studies have repeatedly demonstrated that providers tend to underestimate blood loss in cases of postpartum hemorrhage, um, which can lead to delays in care. Um, and this is just an example. This is a randomized controlled trial uh, by Toledo et al. that found the error rate um, go, uh, was 16% when the blood loss was 300 milliliters, uh, but the error rate went up to 41% when the blood loss was two liters. 
Um, on the other hand, when QBL or quantitative blood loss was used, um, the error rate was pretty consistently low at less than 15% at all volumes. On the other hand, we also seem to uh, overestimate blood loss when there is no hemorrhage, um, as demonstrated in this prospective study by Hire et al., uh, which actually found that 57% of cases that were um, called postpartum hemorrhage by EBL um, ended up having quantitative blood loss of less than one liter. So uh, we can see that the uh, QBL or quantitative blood loss offers the potential for earlier appropriate diagnosis and intervention, um, while also possibly preventing unnecessary interventions and unnecessary use of resources when uh, they're not indicated. So now um, several professional organizations, including A1 and the CMQCC, now recommend quantification of blood loss after every birth. So how do we do this at BIDMC? Um, here we use graduated under buttock drapes for vaginal deliveries. Um, for all vaginal deliveries, uh, a birth pause is performed after delivery to account for amniotic fluid volume. After a vaginal delivery, uh, the drape, all laps and pads are weighed. Um, whereas after a cesarean delivery, all fluids are suctioned into a canister and then all laps and pads are weighed after um, surgery. And then a QBL calculator is used to subtract dry weights and any known fluids that may have been added to the surgical field, um, such as any like irrigation. Um, and then that's subtracted uh, from the total. The QBL is then recorded into the patient's chart and communicated to the OB team. So, you know, compared to EVL or estimated blood loss, uh, QBL is clearly more labor intensive. Um, you must account for all fluids that are not blood, including amniotic fluid, urine, uh, fluid used for irrigation, et cetera. Um, and while studies have suggested that QBL might be more accurate uh, and might facilitate earlier recognition and intervention for postpartum hemorrhage, um, demonst studies demonstrating improvement in maternal outcomes or actual risk reduction are still somewhat lacking. Um, Furthermore, QBL does not seem to correlate with postpartum hemoglobin changes, despite um, its improved accuracy. Um, but regardless, um, I think most agree that uh, QBL improves communication and situational awareness among all providers caring for a patient, um, including the nursing team, the OB team, and anesthesia team. And so this may actually be where the greatest benefit of QBL lies. So in addition to quantifying blood loss, laboratory evaluation is an important part of um, assessing hemorrhage severity, um, and in particular for monitoring for developing DIC. A hemorrhaging patient should have an active type and cross match with blood available, and the CBC, coags, and fibrinogen should be assessed frequently, uh, about every 30 to 60 minutes in the case of ongoing bleeding. Fibrinogen depletion in particular is considered an early predictor of hemorrhage severity uh, with values less than 200 milligrams per deciliter raising concern for DIC. Um, we uh, keep in mind that DIC is a clinical diagnosis, um, but nevertheless, uh, scoring systems have been developed such as this one that was developed by the International Society of Thrombosis and Hemostasis. Um, this was designed to try to provide an objective tool for identifying DIC in hemorrhaging patients. Um, and this calculator was essentially, was initially de developed for trauma patients and then subsequently modified for pregnancy. So this uh, scoring system considers platelet values and fibrinogen values and PT difference from normal, and then generates a score where a score of 26 or greater um, was found to have a high sensitivity and specificity for DIC in pregnancy. Point of care viscoelastic hemostatic assays like TEG and Rotem are also, um, you know, can also be useful for guiding plasma and clotting factor replacement in obstetric hemorrhage. Um, these are uh, point of care tests that use whole blood samples to assess coagulation and fibrinolysis. 
Um, and these have been extensively used in cardiac surgery, but there is fairly limited uh, level one evidence for use in obstetrics at this time, but research is ongoing um, for um, the utility of TEG and Rotom in postpartum hemorrhage. Several studies have suggested that these tests can be helpful to direct early fibrinogen and FFP replacement and more targeted transfusions, uh, rather than relying on a more arbitrary massive transfusion protocol where ratios are set for product replacement. And as point of care tests, um, these can be um, helpful by providing information much more rapidly to providers caring for a, um, an actively hemorrhaging patient at the bedside. Um, while labs can often take longer to result. Um, if TEG or Rotom um, are unavailable, then another quick and simple way to assess for coagulopathy at the bedside is to measure the patient's clotting time. Um, this can be easily done by drawing five millimeters, milliliters of uh, venous blood into a clean, dry red top tube and just assessing the time it takes for the blood to clot. Normal clotting time is five to eight minutes. So if it takes longer than eight minutes, or if you see a clot form and then dissolve, um, then this can suggest a clotting factor or fibrinogen deficiency, which should prompt transfusion of FFP. So this is a, a imperfect uh, way of assessing uh, clotting, but can be helpful if, um, if lab results are, are um, delayed or if you need to make decision quickly. Um, management of hemorrhage uh, often begins with resuscitation and stabilization of hemodynamics. Um, and this includes ensuring adequate IV access, uh, which is at a minimum two large bore IVs, uh, at least an 18 gauge, preferably 14 to 16 gauge IVs are um, recommended. And in some cases, central and arterial lines might be needed as well. The traditional approach to IV fluid administration has been sort of liberal fluid administration to prevent hypotension and maintain systolic blood pressure greater than 90, um, as well as maintaining a urine output, uh, urine output greater than 30 cc's per hour. Um, and some guidelines have actually suggested infusing twice the lost volume and up to three and a half liters of rapid fluid infusion of crystalloid um, in patients with greater than a liter of blood loss or evidence of clinical shock. But the concern for uh, liberal fluid administration is the risk of dilutional coagulopathy, electrolyte imbalances, hypothermia, and volume overload. Um, so liberal fluid administration requires close monitoring of uh, labs, including hematocrit and coagulation status and electrolytes, as well as core body temperature. Um, and so some studies in the non-obstetric, uh, mainly trauma literature, have suggested restrictive fluid replacement, um, infusing the minimum amount to maintain organ perfusion at a rate of around 0.75 to one times the volume of blood lost, um, with the focus being on really replacing blood products. Um, ultimately, evidence is mixed for both of these approaches, so optimal strategy for fluid resuscitation remains uncertain. Um, and um, you know, in addition to fluid resuscitation, uh, tranexamic acid, urotonics, and blood products should be administered as needed. Um, and so I'm going to spend the next few slides talking about these. Um, so tranexamic acid, um, I'm, uh, all of you probably know, um, is this is an antifibrinolytic agent. Um, evidence suggests that this should be administered as soon as possible after the onset of hemorrhage and concomitantly with other medications and procedures for control of bleeding. Um, enhanced fibrinolytic activity and fibrinogen depletion occurs early in, in the um, hemorrhage process, in, in obstetric hemorrhage specifically, which is why tranexamic acid uh, really must be administered early. And we know that even short delays in treatment can actually reduce its benefit. Um, so a standard dose for tranexamic acid is one gram IV um, administered over 10 to 20 minutes. Um, avoiding rapid infusion of tranexamic acid specifically because that can uh, precipitate hypotension. Um, and if bleeding persists after 30 minutes, a second uh, dose can be given. 
And the benefits of tranexamic acid were demonstrated in the WOMAN trial, which was a large international double-blind pragmatic RCT of 20,000 patients um, with postpartum hemorrhage after delivery. And this trial found that compared with placebo, tranexamic acid reduced death due to bleeding in patients with postpartum hemorrhage by 31%. Uh, when given within three hours of birth. And, and this um, was not associated with any increase in adverse events, in particular uh, venous thromboembolism. And this actually has been confirmed in meta-analyses of randomized trials, which have further revealed that uh, immediate treatment with tranexamic acid improves survival from bleeding by more than 70%. And the survival benefit uh, really decreases by 10% for every 15 minutes of treatment delay um, until three hours after which um, there actually seems to be very little, if any, benefit. So the bottom line here is that tranexamic acid, uh, tranexamic acid should be given um, as soon as possible after onset to reduce risk of death due to postpartum hemorrhage um, and without uh, any delay. Um, so there is no single approach uh, that's recommended specifically for a transfusion of blood products during massive obstetric hemorrhage. Um, generally, the recommendation is that if um, blood loss is approaching 1,500 cc's uh, with ongoing bleeding and uh, no improvement in hemodynamics despite uh, two to three liters of crystalloid, then you know it's prudent to pre begin transfusion. Um, a standard approach is to start with two units of packed red blood cells and then start adding FFP. Um, and um, sort of importantly, we know that aggressive use of plasma replacement um, is uh, important to prevent or reverse uh, dilutional coagulopathy and replace depleted clotting factors. You might consider administering FFP even sooner, uh, depending on the clinical scenario, um, such as in the context of a massive placental abruption or amniotic fluid embolism where coagulopathy is already present. And there's also no consensus on the optimal ratios for blood product replacement. Um, data from the trauma literature, um, which mainly comes from military and war zones, has suggested superiority for one to one to one ratios of packed red blood cells to FFP um, to platelets. Um, so a lot of places do use that um, one to one to one ratio, um, but this has been questioned in other studies, including um, one randomized trial known as the PROPER trial that found that there really was no difference in survival outcomes when comparing a one-to-one -one, uh, with a two-to-one uh, ratio approach. And so I just am um, showing here some common approaches that are utilized at various institutions across the country. You can appreciate there's a fair amount of variation. And the important thing really is that um, there be some protocol in place um, for uh, you know, a given institution to follow and just having a protocol helps to improve outcomes. So here at BIDMC, we use a two to one ratio of packed red blood cells to FFP, and we prioritize availability of cryoprecipitate for obstetric hemorrhage. Mm -hmm. um, so when a massive transfusion protocol, uh, when a massive transfusion is activated, um, the first cooler that's sent will contain four units of packed red blood cells and two units of plasma. And then the second and all subsequent coolers will contain four units of packed red blood cells, two units of plasma, a, and a dose of platelets, which here um, is a single donor apheresis platelet product containing the equivalent of six units of platelets in a 250 to 300 cc volume of plasma. Um, and in addition, one dose of cryo precipitate is thawed and ready for pickup every hour. Um, and here, a standard dose of cryoprecipitate is 10 units, um, which is issued as two five-unit bags. Um, and the blood bank will package and prepare these coolers for release every 20 minutes until the MTP has been discontinued. So I included this table here just as a reminder of the predicted effects that we expect from each product transfused. 
and really to draw attention to the volumes associated with these transfusions. Um, in particular, you can appreciate how cryoprecipitate uh, compared with FFP can have a much more significant impact on fibrinogen levels in a much smaller volume transfused. And um, so cryoprecipitate, as I mentioned earlier, um, is sort of prioritized in our um, management of postpartum hemorrhage. Um, it's often preferable to FFP for treatment of hypofibrinogenemia because it has higher fibrinogen concentration per infused volume. Um, and we know that results from a randomized trial published in uh, 2022 found that early use of cryo within 90 minutes of the first red blood cell transfusion resulted in fewer subsequent transfusions, um, as well as fewer surgical procedures and um, uh, fewer ICU admissions. One disadvantage to cryoprecipitate is that it needs time to thaw and prepare, and there is also um, some in slightly increased risk of transmissible infections. And so um, TEG and Rotom, where available, can be useful for guiding plasma and coagulation product therapy and can be helpful in sort of um, helping decide whether or not uh, prior precipitate should be administered um, kind of over FFP. Um, and then fibrinogen concentrate is another option that is available in our institution for treatment of severe hypofibrinogenemia. This is a heat treated lipophilized fibrinogen powder that's made from pooled human plasma. Um, a a 50 milliliter vial contains 1,000 milligrams of fibrinogen, so this can be beneficial when fibrinogen levels are critically low, um, like below 100. Um, and an advantage of fibrinogen concentrate is that it does not require thawing, so it may be available more quickly than cryoprecipitate, um, and also may be helpful in a patient who you're trying to um, limit additional um, uh, volume infusion for concern for fluid overload. And so although data are still pretty limited on the use of fibrinogen concentrate, uh, one prospective study found a decreased need for blood transfusion and a decreased risk of transfusion associated circulatory overload uh, when fibrinogen concentrate um, was used instead of FFP um, in a very targeted fashion to treat hypofibrinogenemia. Um, so supportive measures are critical in addition to blood product replacement uh, when managing postpartum hemorrhage. This includes oxygen supplementation to maintain O2 sats greater than 95%, uh, preventing DVTs with the placement of sequential compression devices, um, and preventing hypothermia by utilizing bear huggers and fluid warmers. Um, and I think that sometimes uh, these supportive measures do get overlooked in uh, the midst of, a, you know, acute situation with a critically ill patient when, you know, massive ongoing bleeding is being managed. So it's just important to keep these in mind because um, these, these can really help to decrease the risk of um, developing DIC. Vasopressors can also, may also be required in cases of hemodynamic compromise that is unresponsive to fluid resuscitation and blood product replacement. Um, importantly, electrolytes need to be monitored closely uh, every 30 minutes or so due to the risk of hyperkalemia and hypocalcemia uh, when multiple units of blood are transfused. Um, these lab derangements can lead to arrhythmias and cardiac arrest, and so they really should be corrected expeditiously. Um, hyperkalemia can be rapidly corrected with um, insulin and glucose or dextrose, um, and hypocalcemia can be corrected with calcium chloride or um, calcium gluconate. Um, in addition, uh, serial uh, ABGs are uh, recommended um, to monitor for acidosis and any metabolic, metabolic acidosis needs to be corrected. Um, and uh, adequate anesthesia uh, really should be ensured for these patients, especially if invasive interventions are needed. And then a Foley catheter should be placed for strict monitoring of urine output. 
While resuscitation with fluids and blood products or ongoing interventions um, should be focused on identifying and treating the source of bleeding. Um, so in general, we try to start with the least invasive intervention and escalate as needed. So for uterine atony, um, we empty the bladder, we perform by manual compression and uterine massage, along with manual uterine evacuation to clear out clots and sometimes uh, retained placental tissue. And of course, we administer uterotonic agents. These are the commonly used uterotonics, um, along with their route, dose, side effects, and contraindications. Um, and I won't go over these in detail because I think most people listening to this should be familiar with these, um, but I just will mention a few key points. Um, um, mainly, you know, postpartum oxytocin. Uh, here are standard uh, rates, uh, postpartum oxytocin rates after a vaginal delivery um, is uh, about uh, 30 units of uh, Pitocin in a 500 milliliter bag that's infused at a rate of about 83 milliliters per hour for two hours to give a total of 10 units. Um, and after cesarean delivery, our uh, routine practice is to give 20 units in a, a 1000 milliliter bag at a faster rate of 250 cc's per hour over two hours, um, followed by a maintenance infusion to complete a total of 20 units. Um, but just something to keep in mind is that in cases of postpartum hemorrhage, infusion rates can be safely increased um, briefly, um, and boluses for 10 to 15 minutes are, um, you know, can be considered to a, a maximum of 40 units in an hour, but caution really needs to be um, taken to limit the duration of um, more rapid infusion um, because uh, there is a risk of hypotension and cardiovascular collapse with prolonged rapid infusion of oxytocin. And then I also just wanted to mention that um, uh, hemabate and methogen are commonly given uh, intramuscularly, um, uh, but they can also be in injected directly into the myometrium during a cesarean section. Um, and these doses can be repeated um, with hemabate being re potentially repeated every 15 minutes for eight doses and methogen um, can be repeat repeated at two to four hour intervals um, for 24 hours, um, which can be uh, in particularly, particularly helpful in cases where a delayed hemorrhage might be um, a concern. And mesoprostol is probably the least uh, useful uterotonic in the context of ongoing massive hemorrhage, um, mainly due to its uh, slower onset of action. Um, this, is the, um, this is really most useful uh, uterotonic when alternatives are not possible um, due to patient contraindications. Um, so a few things to keep in mind about mesoprostol. Um, first um, is that fever is a common side effect and can be confused as a sign of postpartum infection. Um, and this can potentially lead to unnecessary antibiotics. Um, and then second, the optimal dose and route of mesoprostol is, is somewhat unclear. Um, and uh, forgive me, this table um, seems to be blocking the text underneath, but basically, you know, I um, just wanted to mention that we tend to give high doses of mesoprostol rectally, um, but this really does have the slowest absorption with the longest time to peak. Um, and the main benefit of rectal meso is really its longer duration. So this might be useful for a patient at risk for delayed hemorrhage, uh, but for patients with active hemorrhage, one systematic review um, suggested that 400 micrograms of sublingual mesoprostol was actually the most effective with more rapid absorption, uh, a short time to peak, and a duration of about three hours with the fewest associated side effects. So um, just something to consider when you're thinking about giving mesoprostol um, for uh, management of postpartum hemorrhage. And in terms of the sequence of medications, there is no evidence for a preferred order um, in which to administer these uterotonics. The selection order really depends on the clinical scenario and the patient and their comorbidities and contraindications, um, really with the caveat that, as I sort of mentioned, mesoprostol just takes the longest to have any effect. So if it's going to be used, it really should be administered early um, uh, in the process. 
Um, and if pharmacologic interventions and the administration of tranexamic acid are ineffective, or if there's a delay in getting uterotonic medications, we um, can expeditiously move on to placing a tamponade balloon or a vacuum-induced suction device to decrease bleeding and begin planning for um, other interventions. And uterine tamponade is effective in many patients with atony um, or lower segment bleeding. Here we commonly use the Bakri balloon shown on the left or the Jada system. This is the, the suction device um, depicted in the middle. This image on the right is um, the Ebb balloon, which is a double balloon tamponade device that you might come across as well. Um, so the Jada is a relatively newer device. Um, this is the only vacuum induced tamponade a device approved by the FDA for management of postpartum hemorrhage due to atony. Um, this can be used at the time of vaginal delivery or cesarean delivery as long as the cervix is dilated to at least three centimeters. Um, in a large uh, US based multi center clinical trial published in the Green Journal in 2020, um, the JADA demonstrated a 94% success rate for control of postpartum hemorrhage after vaginal or cesarean delivery with definitive bleeding control reported in a median of three minutes. Um, there is no definitive recommendation for antibiotic prophylaxis while the JADA system is in place. So this is sort of left to the discretion of uh, the pro individual providers. Um, and it's just important to be aware of some contraindications to the JADA system. Um, obviously, ongoing pregnancy um, is a contraindication, uterine rupture, uterine anomalies, cervical cancer, unresolved uterine inversion, and purulent, uh, like active purulent infection of the vagina, cervix, or uterus would be considered contraindications. But really, um, those are the only um, contraindications that are um, considered for the JADA. But um, also important to note that in the clinical trials, um, patients were excluded if there was retained placenta without easy removal, or if there was a diagnosis of maternal coagulopathy, um, or if there was QBL greater than 1500 milliliters before device placement. Um, so, and this, you know, the JADA has not been studied in, um, um, in cases of placenta accreta spectrum. So, you know, just important to know that we don't really know uh, how safe or effective the JADA would be in these patient populations, particularly thinking about those with coagulopathy or those who've already had massive hemorrhage um, prior to device placement. Um, and then in terms of hemorrhage related to trauma, uh, we think about genital tract lacerations, which are the most common. Uh, we have to do a thorough exam to identify the source and extent of the laceration. These can involve the perineum, the labia, vagina, cervix, or uterus. Um, and uh, these may require assistance from anesthesia and repair in the OR. Um, importantly, uh, Recall that if no lacerations are visualized on an exam, an ultrasound can be helpful to evaluate for intra-abdominal bleeding or signs of uterine rupture. Um, and these are just images of, uh, you know, perineal laceration, a cervical laceration, and then on the right are uh, ultrasound and intraoperative um, images of uterine rupture. And then um, also important to keep in mind um, the possibility of genital tract hematomas, which are usually venous, um, uh, but can also lead to significant blood loss and um, should be considered particularly in patients who have um, signs or symptoms of delayed hemorrhage with um, significant uh, vaginal or pelvic pain or pressure. And then for patients with retained placenta, uh, manual removal or postpartum curettage with the banjo curette under ultrasound guidance may be required. Um, and a patient with persistent atony during cesarean delivery may benefit from placement of uterine compression sutures, um, such as the Belange suture. Uh, there are a lot of different ways that you can do this, but essentially the idea is to manually compress the uterus and place uh, sort of tight suspenders around it to keep it contracted. Um, B. Lynch sutures are uh, placed from the cervix to the fundus. We use a large rapidly absorbable suture uh, such as a number one chromic to prevent risk of bowel herniation through a persistent loop of suture after uterine involution. 
And several small studies have suggested no difference in efficacy when comparing B-Lynch sutures with uterine balloons. And so B-Lynch sutures are generally reserved for cases where the abdomen is already open, um, such as during a cesarean delivery. If atony is not the problem, or if a B-Lynch suture doesn't work, um, another surgical intervention is ligation of the blood supply to the uterus, um, usually with uterine artery ligation uh, with an O'Leary stitch. Um, or if that doesn't work, you can ligate the utero-ovarian artery or rarely the um, anterior division of the internal iliac um, if you have that expertise. On the other hand, patients with ongoing bleeding who are hemodynamically stable enough for transport, um, you know, transarterial embolization of the bilateral uterine arteries is an option if it's available and can be done expeditiously. Um, importantly, if embolization is being considered, early consultation is advised to allow for time for mobilization of appropriate personnel and patient transport to the IR suite. And because a dedicated anesthesiology team is not generally present for IR procedures, um, a member of the OB anesthesia team, along with OB providers and nurses, should accompany patients to the IR suite and really should be primarily responsible for managing ongoing resuscitation during an embolization procedure. So during this procedure, uh, patients usually undergo a pelvic angiogram, followed by embolization of bleeding vessels under fluoroscopy. And um, we should just keep in mind that patients with bleeding from atony may not actually have a discrete bleeding vessel um, and their imaging films uh, findings may be nonspecific. Um, and so this image uh, is uh, from a case of uterine atony and all you really see, can see here is a very dilated and tortuous uterine artery without evidence of extravasation. Um, and it, in this case, the, uh, the patient was embolized empirically and had um, improvement in her uh, hemorrhage. Um, and then in some cases, you might see contrast and hematoma within the uterine cavity um, and bleeding. It's just important to remember that bleeding may be slow flow and intermittent. If no active bleeder is seen, um, Consider removing the vaginal packing and deflating the Bakri balloon or stopping the suction on the Jada temporarily, um, as these can tamponade and obscure bleeding vessels. So, um, you know, doing that may reveal um, a bleeding vessel that can be targeted by interventional radiology. Um, and then if a bleeder is still not visualized, empiric bilateral UAE um, can be performed um, you know, especially in case the bleeding is intermittent or you're just not catching it. In terms of embolic agents, generally um, an absor absorbable gel foam slurry is preferred because it's cheap, effective, and temporary um, with recanalization of the arteries in really a matter of weeks. And slow development of collateral flow to the uterus typically occurs um, within a few hours of embolization. Uh, which is helpful in the prevention of ischemia, but importantly can also lead to recurrence of bleeding after the procedure. Um, overall, however, uh, studies have shown a 90 to 97% success rate from UAE for postpartum hemorrhage. So this is a really valuable adjunct to our other options for treatment. Um, and uh, it's just important to remember that DIC does increase the risk of embolization failure. And then in cases of refractory hemorrhage, um, in a hemodynamically unstable patient, sometimes the only safe option is to proceed with hysterectomy as life-saving measures. Um, we obviously try to avoid this. Um, this is morbid procedure, leads to loss of fertility, can be complex and high risk um, uh, due to the increased vascularity associated with pregnancy. Um, but in some cases, um, particularly as in cases with placenta accreta spectrum, which are depicted here in these images, um, hysterectomy may just be unavoidable. And so obstetric hemorrhage is associated with a whole slew of severe complications and secondary sequelae, um, including ARDS, shock, DIC, uh, renal failure, and multi-organ failure, cardiac arrest, uh, loss of fertility, 
um, in some cases, post-embolization syndrome and then pituitary necrosis or Sheehan syndrome. And so just important to be aware and vigilant in terms of monitoring patients for these complications in the postpartum period, um, even you know, long after the hemorrhage has resolved. Um, and once stabilized and recovering in the postpartum period after a massive hemorrhage, patients may require additional transfusions um, and diuresis for volume overload. They may need uh, ongoing electrolyte repletion um, and iron supplementation. Um, anticoagulation for DVT prophylaxis should be initiated um, after the risk for ongoing bleeding has diminished. And then lactation support is really important for these patients who have um, experienced massive hemorrhage. Social work and mental health support is critical as these patients are really at very high risk for PTSD and postpartum depression. So just quickly returning to our case, who you'll, uh, you'll remember is our 40-year-old, now para-1, who experienced a postpartum hemorrhage after her vaginal delivery. She was diagnosed with uterine atony. Um, she ended up with a QBL approaching five liters. Um, her atony was refractory to all the uterotonics um, and the JADA, um, as well as tranexamic acid, um, likely because she went into DIC. Um, and so she went to IR uh, for uh, bilateral UAE um, with a successful procedure. She received a lot of um, uterine, a lot of blood products, uh, including cryoprecipitate and fibrinogen concentrate for fibrinogen levels that were undetectable. And ultimately her coagulopathy reversed and she recovered postpartum. And so this patient did go on to suffer from postpartum depression and PTSD from her delivery experience. Um, and this is um, a real case that I am um, presenting here, but uh, I think is very representative and could happen uh, to a lot of, um, could be sort of seen in a lot of other similar um, cases of postpartum hemorrhage. So uh, in conclusion, uh, postpartum hemorrhage is serious and is a leading cause of severe maternal morbidity and mortality. There have been some uh, recent innovations uh, to improve our management of obstetric hemorrhage, um, including the implementation of QBL for quantitative blood loss, um, including uh, targeted transfusion algorithms, uh, the, in, the use of tranexamic acid, and now the JADA system, um, which are all relatively new um, uh, parts of our management for postpartum hemorrhage. Uh, but strategies for hemorrhage prevention are still quite lacking, and more recent research is uh, really needed to develop uh, novel approaches for obstetric hemorrhage management. Um, nevertheless, we know that our readiness, our recognition, and timely response and early intervention um, has the potential to save lives and decrease hemorrhage-related complications. And a team approach that really includes collaboration among OB providers, um, as well as anesthesiologists, blood bank personnel, and interventional radiology um, is really key um, and essential for the safe care of these patients. Um, so that I will stop there. Thank you so much for listening. Um, and I would be happy to take uh, questions. And if you would like to drop questions in the Q&A, um, I can uh, follow those as well. Um, yeah. Oh, so there's a, a question here by uh, Yang Ping Lee. Um, she wants. Uh, she has a question about cell saver in postpartum hemorrhage. Um, yeah, that's a really good question. Uh, cell saver, I think, has been typically um, used in cases of anticipated hemorrhage. So you know, planned deliveries where we are expecting massive hemorrhage and we have the time to. Um, you know, get the um, perfusionist and have the cell safer set up. Um, I think it has been shown to be helpful. Um, I think the data are still actually fairly limited, but I think anecdotally, we can say that, uh, you know, we've found really great success in the use of cell saver for our, um, you know, accreta cases, for example, where we're expecting massive blood loss. Um, and it does seem to limit or reduce the need for uh, transfusions. 
Um, but that being said, in the a situation involving an unexpected hemorrhage, a massive hemorrhage where there really isn't time to kind of plan or collect um, blood, uh, I think in those cases, uh, it's probably pretty, uh, it's probably less helpful.